our plans to uh, construct a science discovery centre and planetarium uh, on the site of Sherwood Observatory. Um, so the presentation's in two parts, really. The first part of the presentation is essentially a history of the observatory itself, because I think that's quite important to set the context. The original members were really ambitious in uh, establishing the observatory in the first place. And really, this Discovery Centre and Planetarium project is an extension of that original ambition, uh, you know, for the current generation um, of members uh, to get something that will be really useful for the community and for STEM learning. Uh, so uh, the, the title is really just a working title at the moment. So we have a branding team working on it at the moment that I'll come on to a bit later. So the name of it will probably change. Uh, but the working title is Science Discovery Centre and uh, Planetarium, because essentially that's that's what it does. Uh, so the presentation will be in two halves. It takes about half an hour, I think, this presentation. Um, as I say, it's designed for um, sponsors to have a look at as, as well as members. So it will be uh, going on the web and to any interested sponsors uh, later on. Uh, so the first half of the presentation will just cover uh, the history of the society. The second half will cover more detail about where we are with our plans. Uh, to build the new facility. Uh, this first image in front of you is uh, a screenshot from an animation that some students did for us over the summer. Uh, and again, I'll come back to that uh, in a little while. So uh, this is Sherwood Observatory. Uh, it's on Coxmoor Road uh, between Sutton and Ashfield and Mansfield next to Coxmoor Golf Club. Uh, the observatory is obviously that white building uh, in the center of the screen there. Uh, and the site that's subject to our future plans uh, revolves around that uh, circular piece of land uh, with a derelict building, that uh, red brick building on the roof, uh, just slightly lower than the observatory on the screen. But I'll, I'll explain all of that uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, MSAS itself was formed back in 1970, so it's its 50th uh, anniversary this year, and it was formed by uh, Dave Collins, who's still a member to this day. Dave is the guy standing up to the uh, right, far right of this uh, picture. Um, and he basically put an advert in the paper saying, were there any like-minded people in the area who wanted to form an astronomy society? And they, they met in the local cub and in, I think his local company uh, donated some space to them as well. And they, they got together and decided what they wanted to do. And uh, this is really the first sort of small group of members that, that you see in this image here. Uh, now. Unlike what most people would have done, this, this group wanted to be ambitious. Normally, uh, people who form an astronomy society would get some tripod mounted portable telescopes and start viewing the night sky with those. Um, these guys uh, wanted to do something more ambitious, so they decided th they wanted to build what we now know as uh, Sherwood Observatory. Uh, now, they didn't really have any money, so they bought some uh, land quite cheap off the, uh, off the water board. Uh, that, that company does have significance when we get a little bit further through the talk. Uh, but because they didn't have any money, they basically had to build it themselves. So this image just shows some of the members uh, starting to dig out the uh, footings. Uh, and you can tell by the circular bit of it, these are the footings that what turned into the, uh, the actual observatory dome itself. Um, because they didn't have any money, they had to recover uh, materials from the local area. So they went around the demolition sites. Uh, some of the materials were sourced from uh, the site of what is now the Four Seasons Shopping Centre in Mansfield. Other materials were uh, collected from uh, the demolition of Plesley Pithead. Uh, and uh, clearly, as you can see in this picture, they used child labour to keep the cost down as well uh, and basically prep all of those secondhand bricks uh, for, for use in building the observatory. The observatory started to, to go up over uh, quite a few years. And again, you can see in this picture that they did indeed source bricks from all over the place because they, they don't match. Uh, so this is the dome going up. The lecture room is just to the left, that flat roof uh, structure to the left of, of the image here. Uh, the dome was designed by architects at Nottingham University and again built by hand uh, by the members. Uh, this was the um, mid 70s, uh, so there wasn't as much regard for health and safety as uh, people would have these days. So you can see them there kneeling on the ribs uh, of the dome and putting the panels in place against the framework of the dome. Uh, and there's something like 5,000 hand pop rivets went to making that dome. Uh, and if anyone's actually used a hand pop rivet gun, you realize what an achievement that is, particularly working in those sorts of conditions to put all of those panels on. Uh, 
they made the telescope themselves as well so uh, this is more or less how the telescope looks today um, and you'll see the frame of the telescope there so those black rods uh, are essentially the scaffolding poles that were used when the building was being constructed and they were passed through the aperture uh, when the building was made uh, welded into a frame and then the telescope uh, constructed uh, around that um, they also made the mirror themselves so the original mirror was ground on the premises uh, so it's a 61 centimeter diameter uh, a reflecting telescope and the mirror was uh, like I say made themselves as well uh, we've subsequently changed the mirror and the telescopes been variously upgraded over the years so for example now it's uh, under full computer control uh, and you can use the computer to point it at anything uh, you'd like to in the night sky so that's the uh, main facility that we have today uh, it was officially opened in, in 1986, that was 16 years after the Astronomy Society was formed. And uh, I think as a mark of respect, if you like, for the work that those original members did, it was the astronomer Roy who actually came up and officially opened uh, the, the premises. Uh, you know, and the astronomer Roy doesn't just turn up anywhere to open things, so that was a real uh, recognition of the, the achievement. Uh, in more recent times, we've continued uh, to develop the site so um, about a year and a half ago, uh, construction started on a radio astronomy center, uh, as you can see from this picture built out of essentially a shipping container. Um, whilst it might look like a shipping container on the outside, uh, when you go on the inside, you would never actually guess you're sitting in a, a shipping container. And it's from inside of here um, that we do radio astronomy, such as uh, meteor detection and uh, radio emissions from the, the sun and that sort of thing. Uh, we're working with Nottingham University to try and expand those facilities even more. So in this picture, uh, we've got Nigel, our radio astronomy expert, and he's standing on the roof of the uh, astronomy building at Nottingham University. And that dish behind him is their radio telescope. And we've been working with uh, Nottingham University to try and recommission their radio telescope. Uh, and we'll be able to drive that from the radio astronomy centre that I've uh, just showed you. Uh, we also have international collaboration. Uh, so the guy on the right here in the orange is Bernard, uh, who's a member of the society. And he, uh, with his wife and child, moved to Hong Kong, um, I guess, 18 months ago, a couple of years ago now. And he started working with a similar sized observatory in Hong Kong. And what they're trying to do is replicate some of the outreach that, that we're doing uh, from our observatory, but, but to a Hong Kong audience and, and particularly with some schools. Um, for obvious reasons, that's on hold at the moment, but uh, we were making very good progress. I should say Bernard was making very good progress with that um, up until the point that everything had to, to shut down. Uh, we also have collaboration much further afield. Uh, this is a, an artist's impression of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due for launch next year. Uh, and uh, Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society have been selected of, as one of only eight amateur societies in the UK to receive training on outreach with the James Webb Telescope from the professional team who are going to be uh, operating it uh, and they're basically going to ch channel some of their outreach uh, through us so that we can get to local communities and tell them what the James Webb Telescope is doing and, and some of the science findings that, uh, that it's coming out with. Um, so literally watch this space uh, next year as that gets launched and we start to roll out some of the outreach to do with it. Uh, speaking of outreach, uh, this is uh, an up-to-date slide that I produced a few days ago um, showing the level of outreach that we achieve and the different sorts of outreach uh, that we do. So um, we deliver outreach in a number of different ways. Uh, group visits, voyages of discovery as they're now called, um, are one of the main ways where groups um, can pre-book the observatory, they'll get a lecture, they'll get a chance to look through the large telescope uh, weather permitting. Uh, we're very popular with the Cubs, Scouts and Brownies and Guides, um, which is why the, the number of children's group visits is very high in, in these figures. And we help all of those different groups get their various levels of astronomy badges. Uh, we also get adult group visits as well. So people like the University of the Third Age uh, come to see us. Uh, and then our other main strand of outreach is open evenings uh, through the winter months and solar days during daylight hours during the summer months. Uh, and then we run smaller 
um, numbers of people outreached through a series of uh, night schools where um, a small class of, uh, of, of guests uh, get to go through a number of different uh, astronomy topics uh, with us over a series of uh, uh, six Friday nights. Uh, so um, the, the blue box there shows our total number of visitors broken down to the different categories for the year that's uh, just ended. Um, and you can see we got 1,952 visitors uh, spread over the uh, different categories of uh, outreach that we do. Um, if you look at the graphic on the far right, the, the total visitors one, you'll see that generally our trend has been a, a, a quite a steep climb in terms of numbers of visitors. And last year we were really running at capacity uh, where we got nearly 3,000 visitors. Um, we are down on the numbers this year uh, and that's for a, a number of reasons. Uh, fairly obviously, uh, the current coronavirus uh, pandemic has had an effect on our operations. Uh, we've had to cancel an open evening and six group visits uh, when lockdown uh, came into force a few weeks ago. Based on average numbers this year, uh, we estimate that that's probably cost us about 344 visits. So without that impact, we would have had the second highest visitor numbers this year of any year uh, that we've been in operation. Um, the reason why those numbers are slightly down on last year is that we've had an unlucky season as far as the open evenings go. And I think pretty much every open evening we've had has had some form of inclement weather, which has kept the visitor numbers down uh, compared to what we saw last year. But even with the inclement weather, um, I think our best open evening this year, we had 382 uh, visitors turn up on the one evening. And that was a fairly cloudy evening with only occasional breaks in the clouds. So it, it just really demonstrates the interest uh, in people coming and seeing what we're, we're doing. And we do get quite a lot of repeat visitors as well. So now on to the expansion plans. Um, the area in red shown on this plan was bought uh, by the, the charity in 2014. Now, one of the reasons for buying it was to so that it wouldn't be developed for housing because the light pollution uh, would spoil the view of the telescope. Um, but if you take a closer look at that image, you can just see centered on that brick building um, to the right and down a bit from the main observatory. Uh, you can see a sort of circle of vegetation dieback centered on that building. Uh, and any archaeologist will tell you when you see some uh, dieback like that, it tends to indicate there's a structure uh, below the surface. Uh, and that is indeed so in this case. So if you go into that building, which you can't do now because we've sealed it off, but if you go through that building, uh, you'll find a hole in the floor. And if you go through the hole in the floor, uh, this is where you'll end up. Uh, and what this is, is a Victorian reservoir built in the 1880s to house uh, water for temporary storage for the local area. Uh, it's about 23, 24 meters in diameter, about five and a half meters high. Uh, and it's got these uh, cruciform uh, cross-section brick pillars supporting a brick arched roof. So if anyone's ever been down Papelwick, it's, it's like a smaller version of uh, the reservoir Papelwick pumping station. Uh, so this would have been filled full of water and then it would have been pumped out uh, to the local area. And if you look uh, at the back of the reservoir where it changes from uh, essentially a tide mark uh, to, to white coated bricks, that's where the fill level of the water would have been. So if you'd been standing on the floor of that reservoir where this picture was taken, you'd be under about five metres of water. Uh, this just gives you a bit of an idea of the uh, scale of the reservoir itself. Um, and if you look closely on the arches, you can see over the years, there's quite a few stalactites formed because when you build a reservoir, you don't have to make the roof watertight. Uh, that's a bit of a challenge for, for us converting it to another use because we're clearly going to have to seal the roof at some point. Uh, just another view of the reservoir, giving you an idea of some different views. And then this one taken by a professional photographer a couple of years ago. Uh, this one shows um, the pipe work that was used to lift the water out of the reservoir when it was in operation um, and that light coming in through the roof it basically takes you into that building that you could see on the roof in an earlier image. So um, the question then became uh, what do we do with it? Uh, now this is what I wanted to do uh, but uh, apparently we can't do that so uh, we decided that what we would like to do is convert it into uh, that thing I showed you on the first uh, opening slide is a visitor centre, science centre uh, and planetarium.
Uh, first thing we did um, in the current sort of phase of works <clears throat> is to do a public consultation. So I thought I'd just share some of the results of, uh, of that consultation. We did it in a number of different ways. Uh, we did paper questionnaires to people who were visiting the observatory or we were handing out elsewhere. Uh, we, we did an online questionnaire, the same questions, but uh, you could access on the internet. Uh, we went to uh, the local shopping centre and to IKEA. Uh, and we had some simple yes, no voting boxes, so someone could put a tiddly wink in the yes or the no box, depending on whether they thought our idea was good or not. And we also wrote to most of the schools in the uh, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire uh, catchment areas that we, f we felt were in a reasonable distance from the observatory. And you can see for yourself uh, the results here. I won't go through them in any detail, but clearly there was an overwhelming interest in developing the site uh, to the manner that I've described. Uh, from the public consultation, we have a lot more depth of data. Uh, so this is just an example of one of the data sets we have there, where we ask people about frequency of visits. Uh, we asked what age range they, they represented. Now, an important thing on that middle um, pie chart is that it excludes pretty much all of the children because uh, they, they tended to be family groups uh, um, that we were asking uh, rather than the Cubs and Scouts and Brownies. So that age range doesn't represent the about 40% of visitors we currently get through those uniformed uh, children's groups. Um, and visit type as well. Was it a family group? Was you on your own? Were you with a partner or a friend or part of a, a group visit? So we have a lot of good data about the types of visit people would like and, and the frequency of visits and that sort of stuff. Uh, we also asked them about price point. Uh, and the business plan modelling that I'll, I'll show you in a few moments was pretty much based around uh, those price points with a little bit of variation uh, as a result of further analysis. Um, we went through a phase where we were asking for visitor feedback when they visited the observatory. Uh, and broadly, the point of this slide is just to show, again, that there was interest in developing a planetarium and that we are capable of, of operating a good quality visitor experience. The overwhelming um, majority of people who visit us say that it, it at least met with expectations and most people say it was better than they thought it might be. Um, incidentally, the, the, uh, the, the ones that say poorer was because it was bad weather, which unfortunately we don't have any uh, control over. Although obviously when we build a planetarium, then the weather won't have such an impact on the sort of uh, experience we deliver. So hand in hand with all of that information, uh, we raised some funding for a feasibility study uh, and we got some money out of the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, now called the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the Architectural Heritage Fund and Ashfield uh, District Council. Uh, we did a feasibility study, which essentially demonstrated that there was no reason why we couldn't develop the site in the manner that we wished to. Uh, we employed structural engineers to, to have a look at the reservoir and no great surprise that a uh, Victorian piece of engineering is more than capable of being adapted to the use uh, that we want to put it to without falling over. Uh, this, these are sort of the unofficial goals and visions. As I said at the beginning, we're um, working on a marketing plan at the moment. So these will be translated into um, uh, more formal visions, I guess, that you, you could say. But this, this is more or less captures what we're trying to, to do. We want it to um, inspire STEM learning and, and the young in particular, but all ages actually. Um, part of the reason for doing that is to create a pipeline of talent and motivated people in, in the area. Um, that's important for prosperity in the area. Um, when you look at the demographics of the area and, and future employment prospects and the way employment opportunities are gonna be uh, changing over the years. Uh, it's really important that we have a, a, a good group of STEM educated people coming through into the workforce if we're going to keep uh, employment in the area. Uh, and of course, it's uh, a unique visitor attraction. I don't think anyone else has ever anywhere in the world converted a reservoir into a, a planetarium and science discovery centre. Um, and that'll add to the visitor economy and, and bring people into the area and obviously bring money into the area as part of that. Uh, as I said, we, we produced a business plan, uh, and, and this is it. So as is, um, last year, I should say the year before now, we, we received about 3,000 visitors per annum. Uh, that gives us an income of about 19,000, excluding some specific grants that we get. And what that money does is covers our operational and maintenance costs, 
uh, plus some limited expansion, for example, the uh, Radio Astronomy Centre that I showed you. Uh, and as part of good governance, the trustees um, always keep between six and nine months of operating costs in reserves to, to cover potentially difficult times or unexpected expenditure. And I guess the current situation would, would count as something like that. And the entire place uh, is run on volunteer effort. Post development, we're planning on somewhere around 20,000 visitors per annum, which, which actually could be light. So the observatory would be open most days a week. We anticipate a turnover of something like £140,000 per annum across different uh, types of visit and different groups, which I'll come on to. Uh, and of course, at those sorts of numbers, there's no way we can just run with volunteer effort, although that will still be important. Uh, so we will actually have some full time employees uh, as, as part of the overall plan. And on those numbers, even with employees, uh, the whole thing is self-sustaining. So we wouldn't be relying on grants to, to maintain an operational business. But of course, we are going to be relying on grants to, to build the thing. And that's what I'm going to come on to. Uh, so what will it be used for? Um, well, continued core business, which is what we do now, but greater numbers. A much ramped up school visits program. Uh, School, one of the things about schools is they find it very difficult to uh, get the school together in the evening, which is mostly what we do now. Uh, and a lot of schools said if we could put on a full day's worth of program involving the planetarium and some teaching space as well, then they'd be more likely to come uh, for a full day of activities. Uh, there's also a lot of community uses. So we'll have an exhibition space, which could be used for anything, not just for uh, astronomy business. Uh, a planetarium is essentially uh, strange shaped projection screen so we could use it as a community cinema uh, if you look at other planetaria say the center for life in newcastle uh, then they use that for weddings um, and essentially it's just a high-tech blank canvas and i've seen even demonstrations of musicians uh, using the planetarium dawn to put on a light show to go with the music that they've composed so that so there's lots of different uses not even just science uses um, we can put it out to corporate hires, uh, which will be a premium rate, of course. Um, companies like having away days for their management teams to get them out of the office so they could come to us. And not in any of the business plan numbers at the moment, um, but it could potentially be used for university uh, research and development. So for example, big data visualization. If you look at the Gaia satellite data, that is literally producing millions of data, sorry, billions of data points for billions of stars. Uh, and you have researchers sitting trying to interpret that data on laptop screens, which, which is a bit strange, really, since it's three dimensional data. So uh, there's a very serious proposition uh, to use the planetarium dome some of the time to actually visualize big real science uh, astronomy data. And we've started talking to Nottingham Trent University about that, that very idea. And essentially for businesses, it, it's a virtual design cave, uh, but I won't go into that any more detail at the moment. Economic impact assessment, very briefly, that there's a standard way of calculating economic impact assessment based on business turnover. Uh, but essentially at the moment, uh, for the area, so not just for us, for people coming into the area to see us, we get about £53,000 worth of business drawn into the area. And, and we, we spend sort of our income plus people who visit us spend money as well so it translates into about twenty three thousand pounds of goods and services if we conservatively assume fifteen thousand visits post development then you can see for yourself the impact that that brings uh, and the employment that that brings not all of that employment is with us but having that tourism in the area induces a certain number of full-time employees in, in the general area to support that extra bit of tourism so um that's really the economic impact. But the thing I wanted to stress was the economic impact is by no means uh, the important impact. Let me switch my light on, actually. Um, the biggest impact is not monetized in any of the metrics that anyone uses at the moment. And that impact is inspiring people, uh, encouraging kids to take up STEM subjects, encouraging adults and kids to take a general in interest and understanding of science. And that is a much, much bigger impact than those numbers that I've got on this slide. And, you know, I would absolutely love it if uh, one day um, there's someone being interviewed on the news about some fantastic space mission to Europa or somewhere, and the interviewer turns around and says to her, what got you into doing this in the first place? And she says, 
I went to Sherwood Observatory. I spent an afternoon there and I was absolutely hooked. And that's what got me into this as a career. I mean, that would just be the icing on the cake. Uh, we have more modest um, recognition at the moment than that, of course. And this is just some examples. I won't read them out, uh, but just of some school visits uh, where basically they wrote back to us and they were uh, saying what a good time that they had and how it got the kids really inspired uh, to, to learn more in the national curriculum. Uh, I just wanted to play this video now. Unfortunately, I'm not sure the sound will work or the internet connection, but um, one of the things we did last summer was uh, have two architect students from Nottingham University, which, uh, which Nottingham fully funded, uh, develop our plans a bit further. And as well as the usual CAD uh, outline designs, they produced this two minute video, uh, which illustrates what the facility will look like. So if you think back to the uh, images that I showed you before, the inside of the reservoir, uh, I'll now show you what we hope it'll look like when we finish developing it. The video is in about two parts. The first part shows the inside of the reservoir, and then the, the, the next little bit has um, what it looked like uh, from the outside. So I will just uh, run the video now. Uh, and I'll do a bit of a voiceover. So again, you can see the uh, reservoir walls there. So those curved walls are the outside of the reservoir, and you can see the pillars supporting the roof there. So the idea would be to have a big open space that we could use for uh, multi-purpose exhibitions, which could be repurposed for different exhibitions. Uh, next thing you see is some meeting rooms where we just put, essentially put dividing walls in uh, along some of the lines of pillars. Uh, that's been important based on feedback from the schools that we've been talking to because they need static classrooms if they're going to come for a day, as well as having the kids uh, sit in the planetarium dorm. And, and believe you me, having spent two days at the planetarium conference, you do not want to spend two full days sitting in a planetarium dorm. It, uh, uh, dorm. it makes you feel quite ill. Um, so this is just some of the teaching space there. Uh, th these plans will vary. This is, this is really just conceptual at this stage. Clearly, when we appoint professional architects, some of this might change, but it gives you an idea. So we've got a computer suite there. And then uh, we move outside. So the original observatory stays as is. Uh, for anyone who's worried, we don't lose a significant portion of the sky to this uh, for the telescope at all. Uh, so the concept is we have a ramp that goes up the outside of the reservoir covered. Uh, it shouldn't be raining in there. And then there's the planetarium on the left. We have a viewing platform and a small cafe on the roof of what is now the reservoir. And then we have another ramp going down underground into the uh, reservoir space that was subject to the first part of the video. Uh, we have an entrance hall and, and an elevator in the entrance hall as well that takes you up to the planetarium and down to, to the reservoir floor. So, so that's really just the concept. And for those golfers amongst you who are looking out over Coxmoor Golf Club there, uh, the students ran out of time, so they didn't put all of the trees back in Coxmoor Golf Club. We're not actually planning on denuding the whole of Coxmoor Golf Club of trees. So I thought I would now mention the supporters that we've got so far. We've, we've been out and about um, talking to businesses in the area for the past year or so, probably a little bit more. And whoever we talk to really gets hooked on the idea. Uh, and so these are just the businesses that have offered their support uh, for nothing on a pro bono basis. Uh, we have paid contractors such as the structural engineers, but the, these are all the businesses that offer the services for free. So I'll just take you through those very briefly. Uh, to acknowledge the work that they've done. So Brown Jacobson are a legal firm based in uh, Nottingham. Uh, they've helped us in a number of ways. They've been giving us uh, tax advice about the project. They wrote the employment contracts for the students who work for us over the summer. And they've been reviewing and helping us to appoint our supply chain uh, during the feasibility study. RSA Cosmos or a planetarium provider. And they've been giving us pro bono support to help with uh, the specialist advice um, on, on that element of the design. Uh, North Midland Construction, as was NMCN now, and Woodhead Construction have both been um, given us quantity surveyor advice uh, and general construction advice on, on feasibility of, of the project. Uh, we've had support from East Midlands Chamber of Commerce through um, free membership and also through um, allowing us access to their database of members so that uh, we can start filtering through those and we know companies that might be interested in supporting us 
uh, in the longer run. So uh, that's been very valuable. Uh, Barclays Startups, um, one of the things that we, we've uh, done over the last year is convert the charity into a charitable incorporated organization. And that was a very important part of uh, getting this project off the ground. Uh, and essentially, Barclay uh, Business Services uh, wrote or helped us to write the uh, charitable incorporated organization uh, constitution. Uh, Nottingham University, I've already mentioned, uh, they provided the architect students over the summer free of charge. And Mike Merrifield, who's head of astronomy there, is also uh, one of our patrons. Um, and th those few in the middle, so Block Digital, JSS Media, and uh, Quiensis, I always get their name wrong, uh, are basically our media team. So they have came, came on board uh, in the last few weeks, and we're, they're working up our branding and marketing at the moment. Uh, and Block Digital have offered to support, uh, support with some more uh, virtual displays of what the site will look like. And one of the interesting things they're looking at is um, some augmented reality stuff. So as we're developing the concepts further, you'll be able to come to the site, put your augmented reality goggles on, and when you walk around the site and look at the site, you will see it as it will be when it's been developed rather than it is now. So they'll superimpose their digital rendition of what the site's going to look like on, on the real background when you look through your augmented reality glasses. So that should be really exciting and that should get other people interested as well. Uh, we set up a project board. Also, most of these people are given their services uh, for nothing. Uh, myself and, and Scott, you'll know. Caroline Taylor is our uh, fundraising consultant. She knows a lot about the Heritage Lottery people and other sources of funding. So we're paying her as a consultant to support this phase of the project. All of the other people there are giving their time for free. So Martin uh, is a local business leader. He's a chair of Lindhurst Engineering, which is just down the other end of Coxmoor Road. Uh, he's very well connected uh, with other businesses in the area. Uh, Liz Barrett is an edu educational specialist with a big educational uh, academy trust. Um, so she's advising us on obviously the STEM side of things. Paul Humphreys from D2N2 is giving us business advice. Uh, Colin Hutchison uh, operates um, the planetarium at Think Tank in Birmingham. So he's giving us advice on what works and what doesn't work in terms of setting up planetaria and advice on the technology. Uh, Kenny Webster is an exhibition specialist. He's currently working for the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, but he's been responsible for exhibitions and outreach at, at places like um, the Science Museum in, in London. So again, some valuable advice there. Uh, that team's now meeting once a month to help us to steer the project forwards uh, over the remainder of this year. So this is the programme, um, and this is based on the National Lottery Heritage Fund as the core uh, funder. I'll just put both pop-ups up first. Um, so we did the feasibility study. Uh, we then put an application into the Heritage Lottery in uh, September last year uh, to put in an expression of interest, which we, we, we passed with flying colours. Uh, the process is then that we apply for phase two funding, as I've called it here, which is effectively the money uh, to do the detailed design and the planning application and work of the visitor experience. Uh, so that would, we estimate, cost £225,000. Uh, and we estimate the whole development cost is going to be something like four million. So uh, we were going to put that application in in September of this year. Um, but unfortunately, because of the current situation, uh, they're now close to further applications till at least December. So we've had to push the programme back three months be because of uh, uh, the current pandemic. Um, that would mean we do the detailed design next year and planning application next year. Um, we then have to go back to the Heritage Lottery for um, the development cost applications, uh, which is uh, they've indicated, but they haven't committed that they would be prepared to fund half of that, so about £2 million. So there's a big due diligence programme that they would have to go to before they release that money to us. And then we'd be constructing in late 2022 for an opening during 2023. So that, that, that's kind of the, the, the master programme. Uh, to do that, um, we need to find 10% of the Phase 2 funding, so £22,500. I'll, I'll come on to that uh, in a moment. So that's that secure match funding box that you can see there. Um, and then obviously subject to them uh, liking the application, uh, 
the heritage lot would release the, the, the other 90%. Uh, because they're only prepared to fund 50%, they would like to see evidence that we are capable of raising the other 50%. So we don't have to raise it all before we put our application in in December this year. But what they would like to see is strong evidence that we're capable of raising that 50% match funding. Uh, and we've interpreted that to mean we need to have contingent commitments for about a million pounds by the end of this year. So we might find some funders that say, yeah, we'll give you a few hundred thousand pounds, but only if the Heritage Lottery uh, stump up their two million. That would be fine. That would be a great thing to put in the application. And that would really help with the Heritage Lottery uh, committing to their 50 percent. And then we would gather the other 25 percent, the other million during the detailed design phase of the project so that by the time we finish that we're ready to go uh, with the construction phase so uh, just last couple of slides uh, the priority actions this year are, are get that application into the national lottery heritage fund for the development cost of 225,000. raise 22 and a half as the 10 percent contribution now that can include pro bono support from businesses that are relevant to that phase of the project uh, Secure bridging finance so we can pay the contractors before we claim the money uh, from the Heritage Lottery for that phase. Uh, Ashfield Council have said they're prepared to look at uh, giving us that bridging finance. So that's great news. Uh, and as I mentioned, gain contingent commitments for about a million pounds to demonstrate viability. Uh, to do all of that, we really need to ramp up our media profile, which is what that media team I just described a couple of slides ago are up to at the moment. So more on that when they start to produce their uh, output. Uh, we've migrated the charity to the CIO now, so that bit's done. We've got to actually physically transfer the assets. Uh, so that's what's left to do there. Uh, and we need to extend our car park. So the site's been cleared for the new car park, but we don't have the materials to um, put down and form that new car park so, uh, surface. So that's something we'd like to do this year. Uh, and a project that Paul's been working on is uh, get BT Open Reach to put fibre broadband down Coxmoor Road. That would be very important for our stage of the project as well, because without that, we wouldn't be able to live stream stuff to the planetarium door. So just very briefly, and this is really for uh, any external people who might be watching uh, this presentation, uh, we're looking for donations of materials and or labour to complete our car park. So we need crushed material to form the surface of the car park. Uh, we're looking for contributions to the £22,500 match fund. Uh, we have got a donations page and that link is shown there. Uh, when I looked this morning, we had 1,100 of that 22 and a half already donated. So we're on our way. Uh, and of course, we're looking for sponsors for the main construction phase of the project as, as well. Uh, and last but not least, there is a consultation going on at the moment for use of uh, some government uh, towns funding money uh, in the area. And we've put up uh, this as an idea for where some of that money should be going. And that website address there is a link to uh, the consultation page of the website. Um, so if anyone would like to go along to that uh, and make a positive comment about our scheme, then that will help us and increase our uh, prospects of getting some funding out of the Towns Fund to make this thing a reality. And of course, if anyone wants to know any more information, uh, then there's my email address and anyone can contact me at any time uh, on that. Uh, so this is just the final slide. It's just a photo montage showing uh, the original construction of the observatory, uh, the observatory as it is today, and what we hope the site will look like um, once we finish this phase of development. Uh, this image uh, actually accompanied a full page uh, article in Sky at Night magazine a couple of months ago. So hopefully that will uh, again uh, engender some more interest and, and produce some positive responses. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.